and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar. Um, the uh, topic of having a uh, this virtual symposium in the spring, which we've titled AGSX, uh, is came about from the um, symposia uh, organizers for plant and animal genomics. And, and we knew that uh, it was very unlikely that we were gonna be meeting in person this year, but we wanted to continue the discussion. So we uh, talked with Brad uh, Coates, who is um, the organizer of an internal uh, ARS symposium that we have um, that is um, monthly, and we convinced him to let us hijack that symposium so that we could present uh, the symposia that we would have had at PAG uh, had we been able to be there in person. And actually this works out well. We've got, uh, I think Glenn said, we've got people from maybe 38 countries. Uh, and so I think a lot more people are able to join than would have been able to attend in person. But we, if you enjoy this, these webinars, uh, we hope that you will consider coming to PAG in the future. Uh, it's, a, it's a great place to get together and talk insect genomics. Uh, we have some, some great symposia. Uh, and so uh, the next symposia next month, I just wanted to go over these briefly, is going to be led by Lindsay Perkins, she has organized uh, three talks by Amanda Stalkey uh, and Josh Benoit and Heath Blackman. And they are going to be talking about um, the, their um, research in arthropod genomics and genome engineering. So these are three great talks. They are already posted on the I5K uh, site. And uh, so if you want to go there, um, you'll get information on the talks and, and including the, the future talks uh, that are still being determined right now. Uh, these are the upcoming uh, webinars that are uh, in the, the coming months in April 13th. Marseille Lorenzen is talking, is going to have uh, speakers that are gonna be talking about new genomic tools and techniques uh, in arthropods and those speakers and titles and abstracts will be on the posted to the I5K website once they are available. And then uh, on Wednesday, this is the only one that's on Wednesday, the others are on Tuesday, but this one is on Wednesday, May 12th. The Honeybee Workshop uh, has been organized by uh, Sonia Einard and Elaine Vignal of NRAE, uh, and they are going to um, have speakers um, that will be um, highlighted on the I5K website soon. So I encourage you to check back and check back often uh, to keep track of you know, what's going on on that website. So I'm going to um, get out of this now and stop sharing. I want to, um, to thank Brad uh, and also Glenn Haynes uh, from ARS uh, for helping us with this. Um, and I also, the logistics are um, a little daunting. And so this has been great for us to be able to tag team with them. Um, and I also wanted to thank um, I5K for sponsoring this workshop. Uh, and in particular, Anna Childers for helping out with the uh, website and keeping it up to date. Um, and I want to thank Pia Olofsson for assisting with the technical, as technical aspects of the recorded talks. Uh, she's going to be helping us, uh, helping me get these talks uh, up uh, as I introduce the speakers. So um, I'll start with our topic today, which is insect genomics technologies to improve food applications. Uh, and these speakers uh, submitted recorded talks and they're going to play after I introduce them. Uh, and I remind you to please post your questions in the Q&A section on the right of the Zoom page. Um, we, I will introduce each speaker and the talks will follow. Uh, and then after that, uh, starting at about 11 o'clock or my time, 11 o'clock, so in an hour, 
um, there will be a 30 minute discussion which we will stick around and we will be discussing um, your questions uh, and um, and I, so I invite you to stay around for that. So um, the first speaker today, I'm very pleased to introduce you to Professor Chris Jiggins, a professor of evolutionary biology at Cambridge University. Chris is also the director of the studies and fellow at St. John's College a, and a research associate at the Smithsonian um, Tropical Research Institute and also a fellow of the Royal Entomological Society. Chris's first love is the study of Heliconius butterflies. His work led to the discovery of wing patterns as mating cues that lead to reproductive isolation. So maybe we can have Chris back to talk about his work on the genetics underlying butterfly wing patterns. That would be interesting as well. But today we are privileged to hear Chris talk about the high quality black soldier fly genome assembly and it's used to study the population genetics of this insect worldwide. So Pia will now queue up uh, Chris's uh, presentation. Okay, hi there. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Um, so I'm gonna be talking today about um, our work on the black soldier fly, um, the genome that we've produced for this species and, the, and some work on looking at the global genetic diversity of the black soldier fly. And so uh, I'm from the University of Cambridge and I'm perhaps better known for my work on butterflies. So I've spent most of my career working on these brightly colored tropical butterflies. Um, we've sequenced genomes. It was one of the first butterfly genomes to be published. Uh, we've looked at the genetics of the wing patterns and um, other traits such as pheromones and generally sort of population genomic patterns during speciation. So my lab has had a lot of experience with, with insect genomics, but um, um, not, on, and not in the applied system such as this. And so I was just sort of keen to use the expertise, I guess, that we developed in these butterflies to work on something with a bit more economic relevance. And the species we're working on is this black soldier fly, as I'm sure many of you have, have heard of this. Um, here's the life cycle, there's the, the, the eggs, they're extremely uh, fecund, they produce single female can produce many thousands of eggs um, and these develop into larvae and then these are the pupae and then the adults look a bit like this they're, they're sort of wasp mimics and the reason this species is exciting is because it has great potential for um, economic degradation and recycling of food waste so this is a rather gruesome picture of a tray of black soldier fly maggots eating a eating a sandwich they eat uh, a remarkable diversity of things. They, we, we feed them, you can feed them on um, chicken manure, uh, animal waste, so um, things like um, coffee, coffee grounds, brewing waste, um, waste bread, waste, waste from the food industry. And there's therefore huge potential for using these fly maggots to recycle waste and turn, them in, turn waste into a useful product which can be either fed back to animals or used as a um, starting point for um, lipids in the chemical industry, for example, or, or other, other um, sources of uh, protein and uh, lipid biomass. So uh, there's a lot of excitement about this, um, about this species, and this is reflected in the um, literature. So there's been an enormous increase in papers on the black soldier fly over the last five years or so. And also in the, in the wider economy, so there's been a huge amount of economic investment into black soldier fly uh, and developing of plants to um, raise large numbers of these, of these flies. And we're working with a company called uh, uh, Better Origins, previously known as Entomics, who are based in Cambridge and who are developing kind of modular systems for um, uh, raising these flies, uh, which could be deployed, for example, uh, onto individual farms to provide maggots to feed to chickens. Uh, and, and so my interest obviously is in the genetics and um, in particular, I think the, in the long term, we were interested in the genetics of their performance and their ability to recycle wastes. But there's remarkably little uh, about the genetic basis of um, variation in um, feeding performance and, and bioconversion. So there is this one paper here describes 
an analysis of three different populations from Texas, from the US, from China, from Wuhan and from Guangzhou. And um, what this paper showed was that on these three different wastes that we used, then the Wuhan strain outperforms all the other strains. Uh, develops faster, has an incre increased growth rate, etc. So that suggests some genetic variation between strains in their, in their performance. Although in this particular case, there's, since one strain is just better than the others, it could be just that some of the strains are a bit inbred and just a bit generally a bit rubbish. Um, but what we would imagine would be the case was be like any other livestock or crop, um, that we could produce strains that would be optimized for performing in different conditions, whether it be in the tropics versus temperate or feeding on manure versus food waste or, or producing lipids versus um, producing foodstuffs for chickens, for example. So we could optimize the genetic performance of the soldier flies depending on the economic uh, scenario required. Now, of course, that's the case for all other farmed um, plants and animals. If you're a farmer, you, you, you grow the varieties of wheat uh, or, the, or, the, or the, the breed of cows uh, that's best um, for your particular um, situation. And uh, that's sort of obviously, we're not there yet with the black soldier fly, but that's kind of where we would like to be aiming towards. <clears throat> so we've done some experiments in my lab where we fed um, different strains of flies on different diets. And we found some evidence for strain by diet performance differences, which are exactly the kind of thing you'd expect if you were thinking that some strains would be optimally adapted to feed on different diets. So this is, these are just kind of three strains that we happen to have in Cambridge. Eve is the one that we used for the genome sequence, which I'll talk about in a minute. But Eve does particularly well on the sort of high nutrient control diet, uh, whereas the Cain and Adam strains seem to do better on the manure diets. So this is some evidence um, for strain by diet performance differences, which would imply the existence of genetic variants that adapt different strains to perform best on different foodstuffs. <clears throat> now, in order to um, facilitate genetic analysis and to um, think about genetic improvement of the black soldier fly, um, I think we need a reference genome. The first step, one of the first steps is to get a reference genome. So there is a published reference genome from um, Yong Ping's lab in China, this uh, Zan et al paper from 2020. Um, the, the genome is about 1.1 gigabases. It's a, quite a large genome. Uh, and it's quite, this assembly is quite fragmented. So there are 10,000 contigs um, and a 1.7 megabase scaffold on 50. Um, <clears throat> So this genome was useful for looking at gene family expansions and gene genome duplication, so that there was a characterization of immune response and detoxification genes in this paper. Uh, and, um, and the paper also, which was really novel, was pro provided the first uh, CRISPR knockout experiments in, in these flies. So there were some knockouts of the vestigial gene, which led to wingless flies, which arguably might be useful in uh, breeding, um, controlled breeding, situations, and knockouts of a, a PTTH hormone receptor gene, which led to um, uh, sort of the failure to go into pupation and, and allowed these maggots to grow to sort of massive sizes. So that's obviously potentially useful if you want to grow large maggots for feeding to, to something. <clears throat> However, the, the genome itself remains quite uh, um, fragmented. And we really thought that we could produce a, a better and more contiguous genome, which would facilitate, uh, you know, in particular population genomics uh, and applications where the contiguity of the genome itself was, was important. I mean, this, this genome that was published is great. It's quite good for finding individual genes, um, but it's, it's not particularly contiguous by today's standards. So the goals of this project and what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, is first our um, work on improving the reference genome assembly for the black soldier fly. And this is really to, facil to facilitate population genetics as well as you know, genetic analysis of this species. Uh, and then secondly, we've used this reference genome to characterize global genetic diversity and to start looking at the genetic basis for domestication. So here was our strategy for producing the genome assembly. 
Uh, we started with a single pair of flies, which we uh, raised uh, offspring, uh, raised the maggots and into pre-pupae. And then once these were pupae, we uh, used these pupae, which were siblings of each other, to generate the sequence data to produce the reference genome. So this was a combination of PacBio long reads, uh, 10x genomics uh, linked reads, which we used to, to scaffold the, the PacBio contigs, uh, and then Illumina high C data, which is great. It detects, this is um, an, a, an approach that produces libraries which uh, detect long range DNA interactions within chromosomes and is really useful for scaffolding genome assemblies uh, to a chromosome level. Uh, we were hoping to use a sort of trio assembly approach using the parents, but in the end that didn't work. So in the end we didn't use the parental Illumina whole genome sequences that we, that we generated. So we just generated the genome assembly from the, these sets of data from the offspring. And so we, we first um, generated a, a pack bio assembly using Falcon Unzip. Uh, and then we scaffolded those um, contigs using the 10x uh, linked read data. And then finally, we generated this high C genome, high genome sequence, which uh, this, this plot shows pairwise interactions between um, loci in the scaffolds from the PAC bio data. And what you can see is it's quite messy, but once you've um, sort of reorganized the scaffolds and contigs based on these high C interactions, you get a beautifully contiguous uh, genome assembly shown here. So this all worked really well, and we think we've done a pretty good job of assembling this to chromosome level. So we end up with seven chromosomes, um, and about um, and six of these are large, so varying from 10 to 20 percent of the genome, from 100 to 220 megabases. And then there's one small chromosome, chromosome seven, uh, which is about 15 megabases and a small amount of sequence which remains unplaced, but this is a very small proportion of the whole genome. And you can see that the total genome size is a bit smaller than the uh, initial, the previous assembly. That's probably because we've done a better job of um, collapsing haplotypes into a single uh, assembly. So we're pretty happy with this, with this genome. Um, here's a few more stats. So it's quite repeat rich, as you'd expect for a relatively large insect genome, 67%. The genome is repetitive. Um, we've got 99.8% of the scaffolds on the seven chromosomes. Uh, and it's, it's very complete. So 98.6% for the Busco scores. So these are conserved insect protein coding genes. That gives an indication of the completeness of the, of the genome. So we've generated an annotation of 17,000 protein coding genes, um, um, which also shows high completeness. So we're pretty happy with this. Uh, we've also identified the sex chromosome. So the, this, this relatively small chromosome seven um, turns out to have half the sequence coverage uh, in males as compared to females. So this shows sequence coverage plotted for the seven chromosomes um, for males over females. And you can see it's it, males and females have similar coverage for all of the six chromosomes apart from this chromosome seven, where the coverage of males is, is 50%. Uh, and that indicates that this is the X chromosome. Um, and uh, we also did some resequencing of um, the lab strain that we have in Cambridge. And there's some evidence here for signatures of reduced diversity. And in particular, chromosome 5 has strong signatures of reduced genetic diversity. So you can see here, this is um, a region of almost complete homozygosity. Uh, and, and another one here. And this also shows um, signature of of low negative to genus D, which is a population statistic that indicates um, recent selection. So these are potential signatures of um, selection during domestication, although they could also be due to inbreeding. And this Eve strain was founded from that, that, those two founding individuals that I mentioned at the start. And so it's possible that the um, signature of reduced diversity on this chromosome is due to inbreeding rather than selection. And I'll talk a bit more about the selection involved in domestication in a minute. 
Okay, so the second part of this talk, I'm going to talk about um, a broad survey of genetic diversity across the world, which we've uh, assembled with in collaboration with Christoph Sandrock in Switzerland. So he was very kind in sharing um, some samples with us. Uh, and he, he's got a, a global survey of BSF diversity using microsatellites, which is uh, a very large um, sample size. It's a very impressive study. And he shared a few of those samples with us for this genomics analysis. As you can see there, they're quite sort of, the, the, we've got four individuals from each of these regions. So uh, four individuals from the whole of Australasia and four from Africa, four from South America. So this is quite a, a crude sort of survey of global genetic diversity, by no means comprehensive, but it's, it's starting to give us some insights into um, these, this species. Now, the history of this species is quite interesting. It's thought to be native to the Americas and probably to South America, um, but it's been uh, spread around the world uh, in association, presumably, with the, the uh, domestication, although we don't really know you know exactly what the, the the original cause of this presumably spread of flies associated with um, human activity as well as sort of deliberate movement of flies associated with the domesticated um, industry uh, and so it's now pretty cosmopolitan around the world so here's a, a phylogeny based on the whole nuclear genome shown on the left and based on the complete mitochondrial genome shown on the right and you can see these two phylogenies are pretty concordant with each other. So there's a, a group of populations down here, which also cluster together in the whole mitochondrial genome, which correspond to mostly wild collected, wild derived uh, populations from South America, Europe, uh, Australasia, and Africa. Uh, and then this group here shown in, in red, is mostly uh, the domesticated strains from uh, North America and um, Europe. And then there's a Central American group here, which sort of lies somewhere in between. And there's a little bit of mixing of these in the mitochondrial tree, so they're not completely concordant. There's, for example, there's one African sample here, which um, is a, um, a wild-derived African sample, which clearly clusters in, 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 the, um, in this, uh, sort of domesticated group. And there's a, bit of, a little bit of discordance between the mitochondria and the whole genomes up here. So there's, there's, a, there's uh, one, uh, one individual here from Europe, which is in this clade in the mitochondria, but is in the, in the um, other clade in the, in, the, in the whole nuclear genome. Okay, so... Um, <coughs> This is another way of depicting that whole genome data, or two more ways of depicting that whole genome data. So on the, if you look on the right-hand side here first, we have a PCA, and this also clearly separates the, um, um, the wild-derived strains here with quite a bit of genetic um, also divergent, uh, you know, differentiation between the different uh, continents. And the um, captive populations here, which cluster much more tightly together, as you might expect, um, which are mostly um, from Europe and North America. Uh, and then, interestingly, these blue Central American populations, or individuals rather, lie somewhere somewhat intermediate between these two clusters. And there's a similar thing in this tree here. You can see that these are the domesticated strains at the top, the wild strains at the bottom, and the Central American population is sort of in between. Now, potentially, this Central American population could be an ancestral population, it could be um, a, an admixed population. It could be sort of somewhat um, uh, intermediate between these two groups because it's because it's because of hybridization, um, or it might just be um, you know a bit more distantly related to the two other clades. And, and I'll say a bit more about admixture between the lineages in a minute. Um, so we were interested in the genetic basis for domestication. And so as a first look at that, what we did was to plot FST, which is a measure of genetic differentiation between wild and um, domesticated strains. And so here's uh, a plot of wild versus North America and European domesticated flies. And you can see 
there are some uh, nice peaks of divergence here, which look quite striking between these two comparisons. Uh, and then this is another comparison. This is wild against Eve, which is our domesticated strain um, found in Cambridge. And this also shows some peaks, and some of them are, are different, but some of them are shared with the, um, um, the other domesticated strains. And there's just a little admixture plot here to show the grouping, to show that Eve is somewhat genetically distinct from the other domesticated strains shown in red and the, the wild populations which come out as green in this admixture plot. And we looked a bit more in a bit more detail at some of these peaks of differentiation between the strains. And there are some interesting genes in there. I think this is quite uh, preliminary at this stage to really say these are domestication genes. Um, but you know, there's certainly some interesting candidate genes to follow up on. So um, some genes involved uh, in cholesterol metabolism, in fertility factors and sperm motility, um, the ye yellow, which is a, a pigmentation um, pathway, melanin pathway gene, um, and um, some neurotransmitter proteins and receptors. So these are sort of putative candidate genes for being involved in domestication, although I think we would be a little bit cautious about that. that that's quite preliminary to, to claim that at this stage, but there's certainly something we want to look into more in the future. Okay, so and then finally, uh, you know, one of the things that we've studied a lot in the butterflies is uh, hybridization and mixing between genomes due to um, um, due to hybridization, mixing between genomes due to hybridization and admixture. And so we were particularly interested in this in these soldier flies because you know there is this long history of kind of um, these wild strains around the world being um, spreading around the world, and then also the domesticated industry sort of shipping flies around the world and presumably lots of flies escape from the facilities um, of these, um, you know, they're, they're sort of fairly low key, some of the industrial applications of these things. Uh, and so the, presumably lots of flies escape and then also people bring flies into the in, from the wild into their facilities. And so we really thought that would be a lot of admixture between these genomes, that the, the wild and domesticated strains would, would be quite mixed up. And also that would be potentially very interesting because uh, there would be a lot of scope for the um, you know, admixture between genomes to generate novel combinations of genes that might be adaptive and might contribute to performance in, in um, an economic setting. So we were particularly interested in looking at admixture between these genomes. And this is a plot, the, the, what we've got here is a, a, a color scale based on the significance of the between species admixture and the D statistic, which is a, a measure of the amount of sharing um, between genomes. And so bright red indicates a strong signature of admixture between two lineages. And what you can see is there, there aren't really any very strong uh, signatures of admixture here. Uh, the strongest ones are actually from, um, actually uh, this, this plot, um, is actually a different set of comparisons to what's in the table here, because it doesn't show the signature in Central America. But actually across the whole um, tree, the strongest signals of admixture were in that we're, in, were where we included those Central American populations with that sort of intermediate position. Um, but the D value for those comparisons is only between sort of 0.02 and 0.03. So these are very low, subtle signals of mixing. So, so what really what this is saying is that that, that genome tree of the soldier flies is quite tree-like uh, and it, it, there's not a lot of evidence for admixture uh, between the different lineages. Uh, so I think that's quite surprising and it perhaps suggests that actually there is this quite distinct uh, domesticated lineage and um, wild lineage of the soldier flies which is maintaining their distinctness across the globe uh, despite presumably lots of opportunities for um, encounters between them. Uh, whether that will hold up with larger sample sizes, I don't know. We might find a different story when we, when we sequence larger numbers of individuals. Um, I'd also say that the, the original, the, the, the depth of divergence between the domesticated and the wild uh, lineages is, is clearly much deeper than um, 
would be indicated just by um, just by the history of domestication. So I think that the domesticated lineage must have originated from a wild population that we don't currently have sampled in our in our wild um, samples that we've sequenced. So in conclusion, we've generated a high quality reference genome, which is now publicly available. And, and that's actually just, uh, the paper's just been accepted in G3, subject to some minor revisions. So hopefully that will be out soon. Um, there's considerable genetic diversity across the globe in this black soldier fly and, and quite striking sort of differentiation between the, the, the domesticated and the wild strains that we sampled, at least in the, in the samples we have so far. And we have some putative signatures of selection or domestication, although I think it's still a little bit preliminary and we can't really rule out just genetic drift and inbreeding causing some of these signatures of low diversity within the domesticated strains. So what are we going to do next? Well, we're excited to you know, expand this sampling of global diversity and particularly to include some outgroup species. Uh, that will probably improve our estimates of admixture because we have a, a good outgroup we can uh, polarize the direction of the SNPs. Um, we can identify genes, we're keen to identify genes regulating performance uh, on the different food stuffs, economically important food stuffs, such as manure and uh, brewer's waste and things. Uh, and we hope to use a mixed approach using selection lines and QTL analysis to do that. And we also want to develop further the, the CRISPR technology to manipulate genomes and hopefully improve the um, economic performance of this, of this cool, cool uh, insect. Great, and so finally, just to say thank you to the people who've been involved in this. Really, all of this that I've been presenting has been the work of uh, PhD student Tom uh, Generalovic. Um, the guy who got me started on working on these flies was Miha Pipan at Better Origins, now known as, uh, previously known as Entomics. Uh, Shane McCarthy at the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute in Cambridge has done a lot of the genome assembly in collaboration with Richard Durbin. And Christoph Sandrock has been a really key collaborator for the Global Diversity Survey. So uh, thank you very much. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Chris, that was an excellent talk. And I know we've got questions just flooding in, uh, but we're going to save those questions. I know that Chris is answering them on the fly. So um, we will have a discussion um, after this, but I'm going to go ahead and introduce Kristen. Uh, the next speaker is Kristen Duffield, uh, a research entomologist and an ARS postdoc working in the Crop Bioprotection Unit under Dr. Robert Bailey at the National Center for Agriculture Research in Peoria, Illinois. She received her PhD in biology with an evolutionary ecology focus from Illinois State University in 2018 where she also stayed on for one year postdoc with the same lab. She was hired at ARS last February to conduct research to optimize the production and formulation methods for entomopathic fun fungi and viruses tar targeting Lepidopteran pest. Kristen also is particularly interested in developing a research focus that improves the outlook for the edible in insect industry working primarily alongside Dr. Jose Luis Ramirez and Dr. Martha Vaughn. Today, she will discuss her research in a virus found in a um, commonly farmed cricket. So Pia, if you can go ahead and cue Kristen's presentation now. All right, well, hello everyone. Uh, I wanted to quickly thank the organizers of today's seminar, especially Brenda for inviting me to speak today. And thank you all for attending. I'm really excited for the opportunity to tell you a bit about my work from this past year. Now, before I get started, I'd like to kick us off with a disclaimer. So I'm a federal employee, but I want to ensure you all that the opinions that I share today are my own and do not reflect the official position of or endorsement by the US government. So with that out of the way, we can get started. Um, I don't think anyone will be surprised to hear me say that our food systems are facing unprecedented challenges. In the face of climate change, food waste, disrupt, disruption to supply chains, and inequitable trade, we have a, a critical need for novel environment, environmentally sustainable and resilient food and protein sources. 
Edible insects generally, and perhaps I'm biased, but perhaps crickets especially, may offer one solution for several reasons. For one, they are highly nutritious, providing rich sources of macro and micronutrients, particularly iron, which WHO has flagged as the world's most common and widespread nutritional disorder. Like other insects, they are a much more sustainable source of protein compared to traditional livestock animals, as they require less water and use less space. And because they require less input, they are considerably less costly for farmers to produce, thus making production much more accessible globally. And importantly, insects offer a buffer against food, sh food shortages worldwide. And finally, as far as eating insects goes, crickets are particularly palatable and are a common food item around the world. And of course, crickets, as with other insects, can provide protein not just for direct human consumption, but can also be used as a highly nutritious and sustainable feed crop for our poultry and livestock animals. And this idea is not at all far-fetched, given that our animals likely do a lot of bug eating in the pasture, sometimes as part of their natural diet anyways. However, there are several barriers, some of which you might be considering right now, that could prohibit or constrain the edible insect industry from becoming a widely utilized food and feed source. And today I'm going to tell you a bit about my research that seeks to reduce those barriers, primarily by addressing disease. Because if you know much about rearing crickets, you're, you likely already appreciate how devastating disease outbreaks can be to colony health and production. And one of the best illustrations of this is the Akita domesticus densovirus, or ADDNV, which is a type of parvovirus that causes malnutrition with concomitant reductions in growth and fecundity, as well as paralysis, and can ultimately lead to the death in cricket hosts. We know that this virus has been endemic in European facilities for decades. But those of us here in the US, as well as in Canada, started facing severe outbreaks of this denzovirus starting in the late 2000s. And internationally, this virus has caused rampant mass mortality and even extinction of local commercial populations, launching the pet trade industry, where these crickets are sold largely for reptile feed, into an acute crisis, costing, costing upwards of hundreds of millions of dollars for the cricket industry. And while it seems that there are a number of facilities that have apparently disease-free colonies, many still struggle with managing this virus even now. So if we know these diseases can be so devastating, where is the body of research to support industry with managing current and preventing future disease outbreaks? Well, to answer that, we need to look to the field of the study of insect diseases or insect pathology. Now, insect pathology has a long history with an applied agricultural research, and the Crop Bioprotection Unit, where I work, is a testament to that. But it is primarily focused on pest management efforts, with the obvious exception of the honeybee and the silkworm. And it has largely neglected the unique circumstances and challenges faced by farmed edible insects. And I wanna quickly make a, ca a caveat here that this is particularly true for research within the US because many other countries have been thinking about the diseases of farmed edible insects for at least a decade. Compounding this issue is that as you can imagine, for the sake of sales and their reputation, many producers are often hesitant to disclose disease issues. And so as a consequence, we really do not have a solid grasp of the prevalence and abundance of diseases within edible insects but specifically edible crickets, which makes it extremely difficult to predict and prepare for emerging diseases. But all of that is to say that I think that there are really fruitful collaborative opportunities between government, academia, and industry to start to tackle these issues with the ultimate goal of proper diagnostic techniques, mitigation efforts, and intervention strategies. So before I go any further, I want to quickly tell you about myself and how I got interested in studying crickets as a food and feed crop. So I graduated in 2018 with my PhD in biology and my focus was very much rooted in evolutionary ecology. And I was particularly interested in researching the changes in life history strategies of hosts caused by disease 
across contexts such as age, nutrition, and inbreeding. And during that time, I used the decorated cricket or the banded cricket, Crilodi sigillatus, as a primary study organis organism. But I also did some work with the European house cricket, Akita domesticus. And these crickets, specifically the decorated cricket, are really interesting to study for loads of other reasons, but they also happen to be particularly common in the edible insect industry. And so last year, right before a global pandemic, uh, I decided to make the jump to applied agriculture research by accepting an, an ARS postdoc position working with Dr. Robert Bailey in the Crop Fire Protection Unit here at NCAR to work on developing fungal and viral entomal pathogens against crop pests. And since then, I have also developed two projects with other research scientists in my building focused on my beloved crickets from ISU. The first with Dr. Jose Luis Ramirez, working to identify an unknown pathogen of lab-reared crickets, and another uh, with doctors Martha Vaughn and Susan McCormick to assess the ability of crickets to bioremediate mycotoxins. And it was, wor it was working through these projects, reading the literature and reflecting on my past experiences and the experiences of others with diseases in their lab-reared, as well as industry-reared crickets, that I realized a seemingly unfulfilled research niche within ARS to study the pathology and sustainability of farmed insects. And so today, I'd like to tell you about that journey, attempting to lay some of the research groundwork on insect pathology and sustainability of edible insects with the current focus of crickets here at the USDA. First, I'll walk you through my initial pathology project where I identified and characterized an unknown entomopathogen in a colony of lab-reared crickets. I'll then tell you about my steps moving forward, both in the immediate and long-term future. I'll then very briefly describe a project where I'm exploring the potential bioconversion of mycotoxin-contaminated grain into chicken feed using crickets. Um, and then I'll follow up with a conclusion. So I think one of the reasons I'm so drawn to pathology is the inherent aspect of discovery. And so I'm going to invite you along on this case with me to play pathologist or detective um, with a case that I was presented with some time ago. Um, so here is the evidence or the symptoms um, that we were presented with in Grilodes gelatis, um, almost always in late instar nymphs to adults. And so this population suffered high but intermittent, intermittent mortality, um, swollen or bloated abdomens, sluggish behavior, and the colony boxes present a really strong, almost sickly sweet odor. It's nasty. Um, upon dissection and microscopy, we find that the diseased crickets have milky white hemolymph, or which is another word for insect blood. And normally, if you don't know, cricket blood is clear yellow. Um, their internal tissues are, we found, to be really delicate and fragile, giving this impression that their insides were liquefied. And in some females, they had absent or underdeveloped ovaries. Um, in some cases, we saw lots of nodule formations or melanization spots, which are indicative of an immune response to a pathogen. And in all cases, we view, uh, when we view the hemolymph under the microscope, it has this shimmering effect. But what does this actually look like? Um, so here on the left, um, I'm showing you external signs of disease. Um, and on the very left, uh, we have the dorsal and ventral views of diseased crickets versus healthy crickets on the right. And I want to point out here that these healthy crickets come, these healthy crickets here come from a population that I keep at NCAR, um, which I use for comparisons with diseased uh, populations. And so as I'm hoping that you're starting to see, the color of the diseased crickets is just off, especially when you compare it to the healthy crickets on the right that are really homogenous in color. So some of the diseased crickets are quite dark, almost gray, while others are really white. And if we nick the Circe to see the hemolymph, you can see that the diseased crickets have this crazy white hemolymph, um, milky white hemolymph compared to the clear, more clear hemolymph of the healthy crickets. And so if we look at that um, uh, hemolymph under the microscope, this is what we find. So um, as with other insect blood, you see lots of hemocytes. So you can see hemocytes here and hemocyte here. Um, 
or these are specialized insect cells that are involved, involved in immunity and defense. Um, these are probably granulocytes in this case. But we also see a lot of fat cells. So these are likely fat cells here, maybe here, um, which is an indicating a breakdown of the fat body. But what was really striking to us is this background of shimmer, which hopefully you can see. It's all everything in the background. It, and you can, you can really see it when you're looking at this live. Uh, but it's the shimmering uh, effect that we hadn't seen before. And so when we first saw this, we really had no clue what we were looking at. And when you open up the abdomen, you can see that their entire hemocell or their internal cavity is stark white, especially compared to a healthy cricket. Um, so for fun, we're going to zoom in a little. And uh, at this point, you might want to set aside your lunch or uh, breakfast. Uh, because it's going to get a little little gross. Um, so here I'm showing you those dissected crickets after we pulled out their guts a little bit. Um, and so while doing these dissections, we really noticed how incredibly fragile the diseased tissues were compared to healthy tissues. Um, so I can't tell you exactly what is going on here, um, except to say that things are uh, amiss. Um, and interestingly, we see some differences in how this disease presents, and we're not exactly sure why that is. So for instance, in the case of this female, she has developed nodules. So um, there are these little brown, black brown bits. I mean, you just see it everywhere. Um, so um, she's developed these nodules or melanization spots all over her fat body. Um, and the fat bodies of insects are, major, are a major site of protein production and are critical for disease resistance as they produce proteins vital for immune function. So again, we don't fully understand pathogenesis in this case, but all we can say is that these tissues are clearly diseased. And for those of you who are playing along a uh, detective with me, I just wanna highlight here that we see some wild blue iridescence under the microscope, which you can really see in this picture. So hopefully it's coming through for the, the video. It's this blue iridescent sheen that we were, were seeing only in diseased crickets. Okay, um, so now we have all the evidence. Um, so for us, uh, being really naive to cricket diseases at this point, it made sense for us to start with seeing what we could culture from the hemolymph uh, from these crickets. Our presumption was that the hemolymph should be relatively clean from anything else or much else besides the pathogen. So we played a hemolymph from sick crickets on three different types of nutrient auger, picked out single colonies based on morphological differences within each type, auger type, and then extracted the DNA from those isolates to then perform PCR and Sanger sequencing. From those, we identified over 10 isolates and performed bioassays on the seven most prevalent. And so here I'm showing you the list that we used in that bioassay. And based on the nature of these bacterial species, we weren't too surprised when we found that our results were really inconclusive. Basically, we did not find any evidence that any of these species were the cause of the disease that we were Um, but no worries, uh, it quickly became pretty uh, apparent that the culprit was likely not something we could culture. So instead, we switched gears to target viruses. And this really made sense to us as we were finding that the symptoms, namely the white hemolymph and the liquidification, um, were suggestive of a viral infection as illustrated in this caterpillar infected with the entomopathogenic baculovirus. So the first thing we did was comb through the literature for published viruses that are known to infect crickets. We then designed primers, both for PCR for sequencing, uh, as well as real-time PCR or qPCR for quantification for both viral genes, but also for a reference gene or housekeeping gene of the cricket host. And then we spent quite a bit of time optimizing our protocols for cricket maceration and DNA RNA extraction, as well as selecting the best reference gene for the cricket host to create a standard curve to quantify the relative abundance. Um, because we, while we found some evidence or we found some protocols in the literature, it just was not expansive enough for our purposes. We wanted to make sure we were really getting this, these steps right um, to lay the groundwork moving forward. 
So here's the list of viruses we decided to target based on that literature review. Uh, we had Gryllus bimaculatus nudivirus, the Akita domesticus densovirus, and that is the one responsible for the mass die-off in industry that I had mentioned earlier, cricket paralysis virus, Akita de domesticus vulvovirus, and invertebrate iridescent virus 6, or IIV6. We then implemented three different techniques to both identify and quantify these viral genes. First, we performed PCR with Sanger sequencing to obtain sequences for BLAST and shotgun metagenomics to get a read on everything within our samples and potentially a genome for our disease causing agent. And we also performed real time or qPCR to quantify how much of these viral genes were in, were in each cricket relative to their own tissue. So these three techniques yielded the same hit. And so it's, it's at this point that we are mostly solving this mystery. So I'm gonna give away what we found now. So here's our winner, uh, invertebrate iridescent virus six or IIV six. Um, and I'll be curious to hear uh, after my talk, if any of you got it right as I was going through, if, you, if you, this was your prediction, I'm curious how long it took you, what step you were like, that's the one. Um, so what do we know about the aridovirus? Um, well, it's a virus in the aridovirus family uh, with a icosahedral virion uh, that's about 120 to 130 nanometers long. It has a relatively large genome with 211 potential genes. And interestingly, the morphology of this virus often results in an iridescent blue sheen hence its name, due to the large number of viral particles that are arranged in this uh, paracrystalline array. And so this is a, a photo from uh, Adamo et al. Um, they found this same virus in their cricket species. Sorry, I have, I have cats. Um, so this is fat body, and you can see these viruses are arranged in, in this uh, paracrystalline array. Um, and so here was your hint from, from earlier. Uh, this is what's causing this iridescent sheen that we're seeing. Um, as far as the ec ecology goes, it's been isolated from a wide range of arthropods, particularly from insects in aquatic or damp habitats, and it has a global distribution. Um, it's actually also been demonstrated to infect rep reptiles that have been fed diseased crickets. And interestingly, covert or non-apparent infections with this virus may be common in certain hosts. So as I had mentioned, we were also able to run metagenomic shotgun sequencing on diseased cricket tissues. We used the Illumina MySeq with Nextera DNA Flex Kit and had tremendous help with the analysis on, um, on this output from uh, Dr. Brenda Opert and Dr. Karina Rosario Cora a virologist from the University of South Florida. And this also gave us hits of IIV6. Um, and even though this was my first metagenomic sequencing run, we actually got really great coverage on the entire IIV6 genome across samples with no gaps in coverage. And we found that our isolate was most similar to a variant of aridovirus called the lizard cricket aridovirus, as it's known to infect both of those taxa. And, uh, and here's the, the paper where you can find more information about that variant. Um, and so now we had our hits. We wanted to know how much is present in our population. So using qPCR, we were able to get another confirmation that it, yes, it is the aridovirus that's present, but this assay also tells us at what abundance it occurs. And so I'm gonna show you the relative amounts of virus normalized over the amount of cricket tissue. And in this analysis, using the level of healthy uh, crickets as our baseline. And so here we use the primer IIV MCP, which targets the major capsid protein for aridovirus and tubu three, which we're calling tubu three, which targets the tubulin gene in the cricket host. So the first thing I want you to know is that 100% of our healthy crickets had aridovirus genes present. It's important to note that my healthy population came from the same founding colony as the disease population, but years ago. And also that these crickets had absolutely no recent exposure. 
They were always kept completely separate. And I, being the sole person maintaining these colonies, never went into clean colonies after I, I had handled diseased crickets. And importantly, uh, these were not sick crickets. I mean, we could see that uh, based on uh, just by looking at them, that they weren't sick. And yet they have this low level of um, aridovirus. But the next thing I want you to know is that our diseased crickets had a whole heck of a lot of virus, way more than our healthy colonies. So note that that's on a log 10 scale. Um, and so I haven't run any formal, formal statistics at this stage as I'm still collecting data, but I don't think that that's required to convince you that these disease, diseased crickets have a ton of aridovirus present. So along with building up our sample sizes here, um, because we have our, our sample sizes are fairly low. We also plan to go through all of our other viral targets with qPCR because interestingly, we see some evidence that aridovirus might not be the only virus that's present at low levels, even in our healthy populations. So stay tuned for those results. And so where are we going with this, with this data? Well, moving forward on this project, beyond, assess beyond assessing all viral targets using qPCR across healthy and sick populations, we are also developing techniques to quantify the absolute or actual viral load across populations, as we think this will be really useful for, for diagnostic testing. We are also fortunate enough to be collaborating with Joe Mowry at the Electron and Confocal Microscopy Unit to obtain T TEM images of diseased tissues to further understand the pathology of this virus. But beyond the immediate, this immediate project, we still don't fully understand the transmission dynamics or disease progression of this pathogen. And so that will be our next focus, including confirming the ritovirus as the disease causing agent by performing a Cox postulate experiment. We would also like to explore the factors that may be mitigating or causing disease if the, in the case of covert infections, because we really don't know if environmental factors like crowding and nutrition or intrinsic factors like genotype and inbreeding trigger active infections in these populations. But beyond the host, we have a lot to learn about the virus, the viruses and their variants that may cause diseases across cricket populations, both wild and reared. And so we have plans to improve the working catalog of known diseases of crickets and hopefully someday farmed insects in general. And my ultimate goal is to add to the foundational research that could ultimately lead to developing screening and diagnostic techniques that are easily accessible for those farming and raising crickets and other insects. So to finish my talk, I want to very, very quickly describe describe one other project I'm working on with edible crickets, and that is assessing potential bio bioremediation of mycotoxins by crickets. So if you think back to my initial slide on the benefits of insects as food and feed, one of the big hallmarks is that they are a sustainable source of protein. While this is likely generally the case, it may not always be so in every circumstance, especially when insects are reared to be fed indirectly to humans, or through the poultry and livestock animals we eat. Because if I'm raising insects to feed chickens, for example, I do have to feed those crickets something. And the food for insects, especially when it's high quality, requires lots of environmental, financial, energetic, and temporal resources. And keep in mind that insect farmers, particularly crickets, are often feeding their insects essentially pet or livestock food, such as chicken meal. Um, I actually feed my colonies cat and lab rat food, if you're interested, uh, if you're wondering. Uh, and so while there may be other arguments, for example, higher nutrition, for feeding insects to livestock, sustainability would not be one of those arguments with this model. And so if sustainability is the main concern, insects do not really fit into this, equa this equation unless we can creatively think about, or we, we can be creative about what we feed our insects. So for example, if we feed trash, and by this I mean things like organic waste, agricultural byproducts, contaminated grains, for example, to insects, and then feed those insects to livestock, then we can valorize this waste into something really useful. And what's more sustainable than that? And this is not a new idea. Insects like black soldier flies and mealworms have been reared on our waste and byproduct streams for a long time. 
But from my understanding, crickets have really been left out of consideration here. And so I'm currently exploring this idea by feeding my decorated crickets garbage. In this case, wheat contaminated with the mycotoxin, deoxynevalanol or DON, or vomitoxin, which makes people and animals very sick. To see if they can break down DON in a way that makes them safe for consumption, specifically by chicken and fish. I'm collaborating with scientists across ARS on this really exciting project. So again, stay tuned for that. And so I'd like to leave you today with a couple of ideas. First, the edible insect industry faces numerous challenges, including our lack of understanding of the unique circumstances that these populations pose for insect pathologists. Additionally, there's room for improving the sustainability of this, pro this protein source across applications. And my research goals are to help reduce those barriers by working to fill the knowledge gaps by developing methods for identification and characterization of viruses, but also working to understand their transmission dynamics, mitigate, mitigating factors of diseases, as well as to develop a working catalog to pull, to pull from when new diseases emerge. In this way, I think we will be more able to start the work that will be incredibly useful to insect producers, as well as researchers, to develop easily accessible and readily available prevention, mitigation, detection, and intervention strategies. All of that is to say that we have a lot of work to do, but it's fun work if you get really excited about this stuff like me, um, launching off of some really important work that's already happening internationally. And, and I would uh, direct you to this really great resource here. And I think these efforts will be much more productive if we can foster collaboration, the collaborations between folks like me in government with others in academia and industry. And so I've had so many wonderful mentors throughout the year, but today I especially want to thank Jose Luis Ramirez, who has been invaluable to me by helping me develop this project and beyond. And so with that, I thank you for your, again, for your time and for your attention. And I am excited to um, take any questions. Okay, thanks. Those are two great talks and we've got lots and lots of questions to sift through for the, uh, for the discussion panel. Uh, I'll ask the panelists to, um, to come forward and then um, we'll, uh, tackle a few of these questions. Um, I, I guess first I would ask Kristen and Chris whether there were questions that they thought were particularly um, perplexing or, <laughs> or leading um, or things that are, will move the field forward, our knowledge gaps maybe. Chris, maybe you go first. Um... Yeah, I'm not sure about that, but I, there were several questions about the genome assembly and why we use different technologies and how much it cost and all of those sorts of things for practical questions. So I guess I would say I think that we use those three technologies because that seemed like the best option at the time. I think now the 10x genomics has been discontinued and the PacBio has improved so much. PacBio HiFi is amazing now, it generates so much data that I wouldn't worry about anything else apart from just getting good coverage of pack bio data. But then the high C data was what linked the chrome, the scaffolds into chromosome levels level. And I think that's probably still necessary. So um, I guess you know, go with pack bio and high C in it these days, but um, I can't really comment on the pro on the price because we sort of did it incrementally over several years and we did it internally in the Sanger Institute. So any price wouldn't be really meaningful at, at this point. I think the things change so quickly, so. Um, yeah, I think the prices have come down so much that I think uh, th these things are, are entirely feasible now. Yeah, There's that's really right. no reason not to. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Kristen, did you want to add to that? Um, I was working on a question. <laughs> so oh, sorry. No. <laughs> sorry about uh, that. Just, uh, we've gotten a lot of questions uh, about um, just the applications of, of insects um i mean your your work that you talked about at the very end is is exciting and new and novel um novel for crickets right because it's been i mean this idea is uh 
is, has been done in black soldier flies and, and, and yellow worm needles for sure. Yeah, but my, mycotoxin is a real problem, uh, especially right now in pet food. I mean, there's all these recalls of pet food. Um, and this is an area where, you know, perhaps insects could, could play a role. Uh, there were questions in, in the, in the Q&A about uh, what's best for decomposing um, uh, different kinds of, of waste foods. Um, may, do you want to comment on that? So sorry, which question were, I, I might have lost it. There's a lot. Do you have Yeah, which I know. <laughs> uh, let me see if I can find it. Um, I think this one actually was addressed to, um, to Chris. Uh, there, it, this was from Jeff Scott. There are many different flies that can decompose waste. What makes black soldier fly, or I would say crickets, better than the others? Um, and so um, maybe Chris, you can go ahead and talk about that first. Uh, yeah, I don't really know the answer. I think black soldier flies just proven itself to be so resilient in culture and also just eats this remarkable diversity of different foods that different wastes that um, that seems to be dominating the industry at the moment. But I wouldn't hesitate to sort of say that there aren't other things out there that might be better or or as good. So uh, I guess it's probably partly just his, his historical contingency, isn't it? That's what's kind of worked. I don't know. Someone else might know more about this than me. And Kristen, do you do you want to weigh in on that? I think it's probably your position is that we just haven't had enough research with crickets yet. Yeah, and so to address one of the questions too about you know well, what if the mycotoxins can't be you know remediated or biodegraded by insects? Well, then that that's exactly what we're we're trying to see. That's the exact first step because if we can, so we're really challenging them with with high doses of these mycotoxins and then measuring their you know the process once we've dried and processed them to see how much they have. And that'll be really the first, the first test, at least in this case. Um, I'm sure there's other waste streams that could be tried out with crickets. Um, this is just our, this is my first step, my first stab at it. Okay, um, I had a question for Chris, um, and I think you kind of touched on this uh, in the, um, when you were talking about, let me get to this question here. You were talking about um, admit mixtures and um, what that research could lead to. Um, in our research, we've been looking uh, for transgenic insects. We've been trying to develop transgenic insects for particular food applications. Um, could uh, looking at admixtures and population genomics do the same sort of thing, kind of find um, insects that are, are, are more appropriate for certain food applications? That was certainly that, that was our hope and you know in, in the butterflies that we study we've shown that the wing pattern genes can integrate between species and, and sort of you know, introduce adaptations into a different genetic background that can be beneficial so um, we certainly expected to see these genomes to be much more admixed I think and that we were hoping that that might then be something we could explore. Maybe we could generate hybrids in the lab or, or get hybrid populations and they might have a lot of genetic diversity that would predispose them to you know, selecting for particular traits. But um, the, the data so far don't suggest there's a lot of mixing between these lineages, but that's quite preliminary, I think. We, we don't have good outgroups in this data set that I've shown so far. We, we're sequencing, currently sequencing some other Hermesia species. And I think that'll improve the analyses and um, uh, and also address some of the questions. Some people ask me questions about the relationships between other Hermesia species and Eleusens, and, and we don't know that, that yet. We don't know whether Eleusens is a monophyletic species or whether it might be uh, mixed up with other, other Hermesia species. So we, we will figure that out in due course. Okay. Um, Kristen, there's a question that's just come in from Marco Menegas. Uh, he says he has, uh, I have a disease that appears sometimes, but it doesn't kill all larvae and they, they can finish and become pre-pupae in adults. Uh, 
and this is in black soldier fly, so maybe uh, both of you want to weigh in. I think it is related to temperature and microflora of the black soldier fly gut. I saw it when temperature uh, increased too much. I think it is a thermophilus bacteria, fungi, virus, or in something related to temperature. And I know you talked about that being one of the variables and things that you looked at, Kristen. Well, it's one of the things that we um, we don't know yet and that we would like to know moving forward or what are the mitigating factors you know if we find that there's these covert infections you know these infect that that uh, insects have these low viral loads you know is it is it the host or is it the is it the um, pathogen itself that's changing or is it is it the environment that they live in so um, but as far as I identifying that particular pathogen, well, for one, I don't know much about uh, pa the pathogens of black soldier fly yet. I'm focused on crickets, but that's not to say that that's my, uh, will be my only focus. But um, yeah, I mean, it would be interesting to know the symptoms and um, mortality. It's not, I don't know if that he has much mortality, but um, yeah. And then without doing some really formal uh, pathology work, it would be hard for me to point him in a certain direction. Okay, and then uh, there was a question that came in that was directed to both speakers. Um, that was, uh, it was from Robert um, Pinar uh, about, he wanted to ask you about the recent ITN insect doctors program based in Europe. Uh, and he asked, do you think that industry will see it as a beneficial program which could promote consulting or would industry rather maintain in-house expertise? And I know, Chris, that you've worked with a, an insect farm, so maybe you have some ideas about how this might work. Um, but I think, uh, do you under, Do you know about this program? It's where they're I, I didn't. I didn't know about it. I felt like I should have done. Uh, I'm gonna go and look it up. Uh, so no, I don't know anything about it specifically. I mean, the company we've been working with here in Cambridge have been very open to collaboration and, 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 and um, but I, I think um, yeah, it can be hard to get information. I mean, we some of these strains that we sourced, we don't really know much about them um, because of commercial kind of sensitivities. So um, it is it it can be tricky. I think working with commercial partners. Well, if I understand this, uh, if this is a program where they're training um, scientists, specifically as insect pathologists, to, to work in the insects as food industry which I think is, the, and the, it's funded by the EU. So I think this is a really um, forward thinking idea that- uh, It sounds great, yeah, yeah, it sounds great. Yeah. yeah, as Kristen has said, you know, this is an area that we really need to do more research in. And um, I'm glad to see that ARS is gonna uh, try to help with that as well. Okay, and I have a question here um, from Brad to, uh, to you, Chris. So we'll just keep you on here. Um, due to cost of genome, uh, resequencing a small sample, N equals four, was sampled for populations across con continents in your study. But do you feel pooling approaches would be appropriate for the scope of your project? Um, so I, I would prefer not to pool individuals and I mean obviously the, there are pros and cons of pooling individuals for sequencing because you can get a little frequency estimates for a population from a pool seek data set um, but um, you lose information on individual genetic variation and so you lose information on linkages to equilibrium and uh, sort of runs of homozygosity that could be important in in breeding and so I, I would certainly favor um, individually barcoding and sequencing individuals rather than pooling individuals for sequencing. I mean, we we certainly want to increase the sample sizes. I mean, I mean, as you say, like four individuals for a continent is a sort of ridiculous approach, but that was just the, the first data set of samples that we had from Christoph that, that, that sort of just started this project off. So we hope to expand the sampling. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Uh, Kristen, this is a question for you uh, from Amanda Stalky, and, and I also had a similar question, so I'm going to tag on to it. Um, she's asking, have you looked at any differences among cricket strains in viral to tolerance? 
And that follows with my question of uh, when I worked with uh, Aaron Dossie and All Things Bugs and we sequenced the genomes of the house cricket, we found that um, it was just really loaded with this IIV6 uh, virus. A lot of reads came from that. Um, and yet these crickets apparently do okay. Uh, so I'm wondering if there is some sort of an immune function in these crickets that's breaking down when they actually get sick. Yeah, so that again, that's another line of questioning that we'd really like to pursue. Um, so right now I just have my, my stock of healthy grilotes, but um, that's not to say that we would not like to bring in, in, in different types of hosts. Um, uh, oh, I just lost my thought Be because we really don't know. And, and I think, I know there's been literature that said, well, don't use this type of cricket, use this type of cricket because they're resistant to these diseases. But I think it might be a trade-off, you know, that, um, that th these different crickets are still susceptible to, to various viruses. And so I don't, I wouldn't be able to prescribe, like use this particular strain. Um, but yeah, that is, that's work that um, we haven't done that we'd like to do uh, definitely. And because we also are seeing, so we have, we were able to, to look at Akita um, that we just purchased and we, we find the same thing. We find different levels of viruses. Um, depending on the species. Sorry, uh, it, these questions are going so fast, it's hard to keep up with all of them. Um, I think Robert just responded and said that this is called, the I, I, uh, ITN is called the Insect Doctors Program. And he's actually involved in this. So I, I think uh, if you guys are interested in that, you might contact him uh, for more information. Um, So, uh, Chris, there is a question from Wynn Meyer asking, um, are there obvious barriers to gene flow in the, in the black soldier fly? And can you detect major genome arrangements among these strains? Sure, yeah, we, we haven't found any evidence for, for major genome rearrangements, but we just have short read data for all the resequenced individuals and in it, those sort of notoriously difficult to find genomic rearrangements with just with short read data. So I think we, we're not in a very good position to know how, how much these genomes shuffle up between these lineages, um, I guess. So yeah, so we don't know, I think is the answer to that. And, and in terms of barriers to gene flow, well, I guess the, the sort of lack of admixture that we see suggests there are barriers. And, and uh, um, Certainly when you bring some of these wild strains into the lab, they're extremely hard to get them to mate with each other, let alone with <laughs> the domesticated ones. So I think there are um, uh, the barriers to sort of bringing these wild strains into the lab and mating them with the domesticated strains that, that perhaps um, is, is why we don't see more mixing. Um, I just, if I quickly, the one other question that someone asked was how many origins of domestication there are. And I, I think we don't know that yet. I think the, this, this genetic divergence that we see in the tree between domesticated and captive is, is not representing the origins of domestication. That I think is much older. Um, it's sort of five or 6% mitochondrial divergence. So what I suspect is that there are the, the, the wild relatives of the current domesticated strains that just not been sampled in our, in our data at the moment. And we need to sample more widely to find that. And then, and then that would start to answer the question of is there one or, or many origins of domestication and, and how old, you know, how long ago was that event? Okay. Um, so, uh, Kristen, Jeff uh, Tomberlin asked a, a question about whether uh, nutritional stress or uh, different sorts of diets, I would expand that to different sorts of diets could uh, affect the susceptibility to pathogens? Yeah, it's, and it's interesting because it's something that I sort of pursued uh, during my dissertation, just looking at the effects of nutrition on uh, an, an individual's ability to, or, or how they invest in different life history traits. So an immune function in reproduction, et cetera. And so it's definitely something that, that, is, that I'm, I'm really interested in looking at. And, and we know that nutrition definitely influences immune function and, and, and insects ability to fight infection. And so I have no doubts that that would be um, 
important to look at to, to see, you know, under different diet regimes, um, does that influence a, an individual's um, propensity to, to develop an active infection? I think that would be really interesting. Okay. Um, we're about five minutes away from being cut off, so I want to give the speakers a chance to, to address any questions that have been asked or talk about anything that has been brought up that, that you might uh, want to uh, end with um, on, as far as uh, what we've been talking about today. Um, so I'll, I guess, Chris, you go first. Yeah, okay. Uh, there were several questions about microbiome and we don't actually haven't really done any work on microbiome, although I know a lot of other people do work on BSF microbiomes. But I just would say that we did look for bacterial contamination in, in the genome, the whole genome sequence data, and we didn't find any significant evidence for that. So I don't think they have a, uh, you know, a Wolbachia or one of these endosymbiotic bacteria. Um, but they certainly have a gut microbiome, which could be really important for thinking about feeding on these different foodstuffs. So that's one question. Um, I don't know, Kristen, you go. I can't see any others that I haven't talked about yet. Um, well, if we're just ending on thoughts in general, you know, a lot of my answers are we don't know, we don't know, because there's just a whole heck of a lot of, of, of research to be done and, and stuff that I'm really looking forward to. And so I also have an open invitation if you get, catch a really nasty looking cricket and you want to just send it to me so I can, uh, can, can, can uh, kind of increase my working catalog of the diseases that are out there because I kind of showed you what I know um, and as far as viruses go. And so always looking to expand, um, expand that. I think that'll be really helpful moving forward. Okay, well, um, this has been really a great um, kickoff to our webinar series. And so um, I encourage you to check back with the I5K website off, often because uh, as speakers are added and, and information on talks, uh, you'll, you'll be able to uh, keep up to date on that. Uh, and also uh, if you haven't signed up um, for, the, for the Zooms, <laughs> I see you, you're fighting a cat too. I, I've been able to swap mine down. Um, and also I wanted to tell you that the recording uh, for this webinar is, is going to be posted uh, by I5K. Um, and I think they have a, a YouTube channel, uh, but if you look at the I5K website for AGSX, you'll, you'll find that information too. So for those, that didn't have a chance to, um, to hear the talks, those talks will be available um, on, on the website. So I wanted to thank both of our speakers, Chris and Kristen, and I'm really thankful for all the time that they put into this. And I'm thankful to you for, for uh, coming and, and the great questions and the great discussion. Um, I believe, Brad, uh, are you uh, able to jump on? Uh, is there a Slack channel that's going to uh, continue these discussions? Uh, yes, there is. I am transferring all questions and answers that went through the Q&A box onto a, a Slack channel called AGSX Spring 2021 uh, that has been created. And I can uh, I think a lot of people who attended the AGS back in June of last year um, had a link for that, but I can discuss with Rob Waterhouse, who moderates that, to um, find out who all is on the, the Slack channel currently and if it can provide links to those people who need to sign up if they wish to continue online. And obviously, more questions can be asked than if uh, speakers are willing to go on periodically and, and answer them. Okay. All right. Thank you. And thank you all for attending. Uh, we look forward to talking to you next month uh, when Lindsay Perkin. Uh, is, uh, has a great uh, webinar uh, already lined up. So thank you very much uh, and enjoy your day, evening, night, wherever you are. Thank you. <laughs>